to talk to you this morning about um, decision making. You know, as, as, as followers of Jesus Christ, we, we're called to, to step out sometimes of our normal comfort zone and do things that other people think you must be mad to do that. And how do we know if we're doing what Jesus wants us to do or being mad? Basically, that's the question. And um, so that's what it comes down to. So what do you like at making choices, making decisions? Horrific. Okay. A voice from a young voice from the front here. Horrific. And Sarah, you've got so many more decisions to make in life. Some of us some of us have got less decisions to make now. Let me read this story to you. There was a wealthy eccentric who died and he left a million dollars to his nephew John. When the will was read at the lawyer's office, the lawyer said to John, According to your uncle's instructions, payment of your inheritance will depend on choices you must make. The lawyer held his two fists out in front of him and, and asked, Do you choose what is in my right hand or my left hand? John decided what to take was in the attorney's right hand. The lawyer opened his hand to reveal a gold coin and a silver coin. Had you chosen this hand, he said, you would have received substantial share in a gold mine or a silver mine in Chile. Then he opened his right hand, sorry, to reveal a nut and a coffee bean. He said, these represent a million dollars worth of nuts or coffee from Brazil. <coughs> Which do you choose? John decided on the nuts. A week went by before John arrived in Brazil to take charge of his holdings. In the interim, fire destroyed a huge warehouse where the nuts that John had inherited were stored, and coffee prices doubled. So he made the wrong choice. If he'd gone with coffee, he'd have done well, but he chose the nuts, and he went wrong. Since John hadn't got around to insuring his holdings, he soon was bankrupt. He barely had enough for his airfare home to New York or Los Angeles, where he could stay with a friend. He chose Los Angeles. Just before he took off, the New York plane came out on the runway. It was a brand new superjet. For the connecting flight to Los Angeles, the plane was a 1928 Ford trimotor with a sway back that took half a day to get off the ground. It's filled with crying children and tethered goats. Over the Andes, one engine fell off. A man crawled up to the cockpit and said, let me out if you want to save your lives. Give me a parachute. The pilot agreed but said, on this airline, anybody who bails out must wear two parachutes. John jumped from the plane, and as he fell, he tried to make up his mind which ripcord to pull. Finally, he chose the one on the left. It was rusty, and the wire pulled loose. He pulled the other handle. The chute opened, but its shroud lines snapped, and in desperation, the poor fellow, plummeted into the ground, cried out, St. Francis, save me! <coughs> Suddenly, a great hand reached down from heaven, seized the poor man's wrist, and left him dangling in midair. Then a gentle voice said, St. Francis Xavier, or St. Francis of Assisi? <laughs> yeah, silly story, isn't it? And sometimes we feel that whatever choice we make, we seem to have made the wrong choice. And here's this tension we have in our walk of faith. How do we know if we're taking God-inspired leap of faith, or just being stupid? How do you demonstrate faith in a supernatural God if you never take any chances? If we just sit at home wrapped in cotton wool, just me and Jesus, isolated, sounds great, but that's not what Jesus has called us to do. How can we build his kingdom? How can we turn the world the right way around? How can we impact society if we just shut ourselves off? So we've got to take chances, but how do we make good choices with the chances we take? Because at the same time, it'd be reckless for us just to drive around without putting our seatbelts on, thinking, well, Jesus is with me. And if he wants me to have a crash, he'll have a crash, otherwise I'll be safe. I'm trusting Jesus. I don't need a seatbelt. I've come across people who didn't take out house insurance because they were trusting Jesus. And then when they were burgled, not by Jesus, but they had nothing to fall back on. How do you know when you're making sensible choices or just being stupid. When we choose to follow Jesus, he calls us out of our comfort zones, wants to mobilize us, each one of us, not just pastors or people that stand at the front, every one of us, Jesus is calling to be an agent for change, to be a kingdom builder. A couple of days ago, Kath shared this picture on Facebook. It says this, today is a new day. 
I can't read it from there. Uh, you can start with a, um, you can start fresh, wipe the slate clean and begin again. Today you can embrace kindness, you can practice compassion, you can stand up for justice, you can talk to strangers, you can ask for help and offer help, you can listen with your whole heart, you can work for the common good, you can love well, you can be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's what each one of us is called to do. The world won't change for the better if we all just mind our own business. Now I acknowledge at this point that some people, if they minded their own business, the world would be a lot better place, okay? <laughs> Let's just get that clear, because I know some of you are thinking that already. But each one of us, if we just keep to ourselves, we're not going to change the world for the better. So following Jesus involves doing strange things, and by the way, not being strange. Okay, so you don't, we don't need to be weird to follow Jesus. Just get that clear for some of you. Um, but it does call us. It, it does call us to do some strange things. <laughs> At some point, it's going to be making decisions that involve risk, and other other people would think are stupid. Just a couple of examples. November two thousand and one. Ellen and I decided that I should resign from my full-time, secure, respected, professional, well-paid job as a college lecturer so that I could study at Bible college and work in the church. When I told people in the college that I was doing that, they thought I was stupid. They were probably right. But they, you know, I remember one person saying to me, what about your pension? I said to him, well, if Jesus is going to look after me next week, he'll have to look after me in the future as well. But sometimes we're called to do things that people would think strange. We're just over two, two years into a 25-year... At the point we made that decision, Ellen and I were just two years into a 25-year mortgage with four young children to provide for. And I was stepping out of that job into an unknown. There was a risk to take and a hope that Jesus would provide for us. But the Bible's full of examples of people that are being called to take risks for Jesus' sake. And just a couple of those to look at. So is this trust or stupidity? The call for Peter, James and John. There they were, uh, quite young men at the start of their career as professional fishermen with boats and nets, families to look after, and this stranger turns up on the beach and says, I want you to leave all that and follow me. About, about 2,000 years before that, before Jesus went up to these guys and called them to follow him, there was a guy called Abraham. It wasn't called Abraham at the time, but that's how we know him. And God said to him, where he was settled in his city, where he had a, a nice home, a respectable position, God said to him, I want you to leave. Pack up everything and go to a place that you've never heard of. And there was no Google Maps or anything for Abraham to see what he was going on, no street view, no maps or, at all. He was heading off into the unknown. There's a guy called Gideon. He was living in Israel before they'd had any kings and the, the country was overrun by an enemy called the Midianites the people of God were powerless every time they got any crops together, did any hard work, any harvesting this swarm of Midianites would come in and they'd say thanks very much guys and take it all away destroy everything and be gone like a, a cloud of locusts coming in and Gideon is working in hiding He's terrified and an angel turns up from God and says, listen, you're going to lead the people, you're going to raise an army and overthrow the Midianites. Hmm. That involved Gideon making steps. Now there were consequences for these people. For Peter, James and John, they could have ended up jobless. They were given up their livelihood. Those nets and boats weren't going to be there when they came back. How were they going to make a living? How were they going to provide for their family? How, what future did they have if they turned their backs on the career that they've been training for most of their lives? For Abraham, he could have ended up homeless because he, he, he was giving up his home and heading off in a tent. 
to go somewhere he never heard of. What about Gideon? Consequences for Gideon, anyone? He lost his life. He lost his life. He could have ended up lifeless because he was going to stand up against an enemy that was much bigger than him. Consequences of the decisions we make. And when Jesus calls us to step out in faith, very often we've got to weigh up what are the consequences. And am I being called by God? Or am I making a stupid decision? Of course, if we're facing that situation, we could ask for a sign. In Judges chapter 6, Gideon himself asked God for a sign. God turns up, he sends an angel to Gideon. He says to him, mighty warrior, I want you to raise an army and defeat the enemy. And Gideon's thinking, how do I know that God's speaking to me? You got that? Ever been in that situation where an angel appears to you and says, God's telling you to do this, and you think, well, how do I know it's God? Is God really telling me to do this? And this, this angel performs some kind of a miracle with a sacrifice that's offered, and Gideon's thinking, I wonder if God's really in this. And so he says to God, Gideon says to God, I'm going to... I want you to just give me a sign that this is really you, you know, that's sending the angel and doing these miracles and things like that. And it says this in chapter 6, that Gideon prayed to God, I know that you promised to help me rescue Israel, but I need proof. Tonight, I'll put some wool on the stone floor of your, uh, that threshing place over there. If you will help me rescue Israel, then tomorrow morning, let there be dew on the wool, but let the stone floor be dry. So Gideon is asking for a minor miracle here, as some kind of a sign that God is really telling you. Now if you think about it, that's quite insulting, isn't it, to God? He's saying to God, how do I know that you promise, you know, that you'll keep your promise to keep me safe and make me successful in this? Do you know what? So many of us do that though. God tells us to do something and we think. How do I know I'm not going to end up looking stupid? Sometimes God might prompt you to say, go and pray for that person. You see somebody ill and God says, go and pray for that person. And you think, yeah, but if nothing happens, I'm going to look stupid. And so we don't do it. Well, God says to you, I want you to go and tell that person. Just go and encourage them or phone them up or send them a message. Just let them know that you're thinking of them. And you think, oh, I think I'm being a bit weird. And that's within the church, never mind people outside the church. And we're afraid to step out in faith in case somehow God doesn't do what he's promised to do. Because God might not keep this promise, even though he keeps all his other promises. And so we're scared. And we hang back. So the following morning, Gideon says, okay, well, I'm going to put out some, some lamb's fleece there. I want the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. Next morning, the fleece is wet and the ground is dry. And Gideon says, um, look, I think he's playing for time. He says, look, let's do it the other way, tomorrow morning. Okay, let's do it the other way. Let's have the ground wet and the fleece dry. Next morning, that's how it is. By the way, sometimes you might hear people in the church talking about putting out a fleece. And that's what they mean. Okay, when they say it's nothing to do with those little jumpy, scratchy things. It's about, you know, I'm asking God for a sign, asking God to show me that he's in this. Was Gideon wrong to ask for a sign? Right, okay, I can ask you to make a decision now. Hands up if you think Gideon was wrong. Hands up if you think Gideon was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and hands up if you didn't put your hand up before. Yeah, it's like, afraid to be wrong. Is it wrong to ask God for a sign? I think what is wrong here, and I might have this later in my notes, so I might say it again later. I think what is wrong here is sometimes we ask God to jump through certain hoops just to suit ourselves. There's a, a Christian writer, um, Adrian Plass, he writes humorous things and one of his most famous works is the sacred diary of Adrian Plass in which he's going to write 
uh, and not Adrian Boll, no, the sa not the Secret Diary of Adrian Boll, that's a different book altogether. The Sacred Diary of Adrian Plass, age 37 and three quarters he is. And um, this, is a, this is a Christian struggling with the Christian life like so many of us do, and it's well worth reading. A bit dated maybe now, but quite funny. And um, he starts his diary because he wants to keep an account of all the amazing things that God's doing in his life. And he starts his diary day one and nothing happens. You know, and then next day, day two, and nothing happens. But eventually it comes to this point, it's December, and they're asked to go out carol singing. And he feels obliged to volunteer to go out carol singing. Even though he's uncomfortable about it, he feels that he should do it. And then it says, on Monday the 16th of January, he says this, My son Gerald, same as James Bond, is on next Saturday evening. Pity it clashes. This is in the days before this catch-up TV and hiring the DVD and downloading things, all that. This is when you, the, the days when you had to watch things when they were on the telly or you missed it. Okay, so Saturday night this film is on and he couldn't watch it. Absent mind, a um, few days later he's thinking, is Carol, screen, uh, is Carol singing scriptural? You know, he's trying to think of a way of getting out of the Carol singing so that he can, he can um, stay at home with a clear conscience and watch the James Bond film. He opens his Bible at random and put his finger on a page, seeing if God's going to guide him. It says this, the dogs licked up the blood. It didn't help him in any way. On Friday, he lays out a fleece. He says this, if a midget in a Japanese admiral's uniform comes to the door at 9.04 precisely, I will know that God wants me to go carol singing. Of course, it doesn't happen, does it? You know, sometimes that is the danger with putting out a fleece. Are we trusting God's word? How much are we trusting God? How much are we asking God to jump through certain hoops just to suit us? Who is being the Lord and who is being the servant in the situation? Jesus spoke about putting out signs in uh, Matthew chapter 16. It says this in verse 1, The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tried to test him. Note that. They try to test him by asking for a sign from heaven. So here is Jesus going about his earthly ministry, preaching words with authority that nobody can, can question in any way, performing miracles in front of people's eyes, demonstrating the power of God, living the presence of God, working with the authority of God. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to him and say, can you prove to us that you're actually God? What are they doing? They're refusing to see the evidence of their own eyes. So they're asking Jesus to jump through a hoop for him. What's the sad you see there? The Pharisee would have learned the pre What's the sad Okay, what's the difference between Pharisees and Sadducees? Sadducees were more from the, um, the elite of society in terms of that they were people usually with some kind of inheritance and some kind of status in society. The Pharisees were people who'd, who'd studied, put a lot of work into training and effort, and it was all about how righteous they could be. There's all sorts of theological differences because the Pharisees believed in re, um, that there was life after death. The Sadducees didn't believe in that. So there's these sort of different camps, um, different theology amongst them and so on. Does that help? Okay, good question, Steve. Thanks for asking. Uh, so Jesus says this to them in verse 2. He says, if the sky is red in the evening, you say the weather will be good. And if it's red in the morning, you say it's bad. Don't we? well, we've got that saying in our language, haven't we? Red in the sky, shepherd's pie. Yeah, that's the one. So if, if we, we, we know how to read the signs ourselves. Um, but if you say the sky is red and gloomy in the morning, you say it's going to rain. You can tell what the weather will do by looking at the sky but you don't understand what is happening now. In other words, you're looking at me, but your mind is closed and you're refusing to accept it. Now as followers of Jesus Christ, we can do like that as well. We can refuse to accept what he's making plain to us. And Jesus says this, you want a sign because you are evil and won't believe. But the only sign you will be given is what happened to Jonah. And that makes it clear, doesn't it? Does it? That really helps. So we're all clear on that. Okay, good. So as Pharisees and Sadducees refuse to see the evidence that's already in front of them, 
Uh, we mustn't get into this habit of making jo God jump through hoops. He asks us to do something, we say, well, I'll do it if you do this and this and this. And then I'll believe you, God. The sign of Jonah. What did Jonah do? He disobeyed Jesus. He disobeyed. This is, I was trying to understand what this sign of Jonah is about. And this is what I think the Lord said to me. And if I'm wrong, please come and correct me afterwards in love. Um, but just see if this helps in some way. God said to Jonah, I want you to travel overland to the east to a place called Nineveh. So Jonah jumps up and gets a boat over the sea to the west to Tarshish. Okay? There's the sign of Jonah. When God says, I want you to do this, we do the opposite. And it didn't end well for Jonah at first, but ultimately, Jonah ended up doing what God wanted him to do. And despite his reluctance, God's plans were still fulfilled. If we refuse to do what God wants us to do, if we try and do the opposite or just try and do nothing... God's plans will still be fulfilled. So if you're asking for a sign, go on Ellen, ask that question. I was just going to say, Jonah deliberately did the opposite to what God asked him to do. He knew what God was saying to him. What if you're not sure that that's what God's telling you to do? Right, okay. There's a difference, Yeah, so we're, we're coming to this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we're going to get to this. So we're still at this point, okay? So God's asking us to do, now in Jonah it was clear, God wanted him to do one thing. Jonah thought it was a bad idea. Because the Ninevites were the enemies of God's people. And God's saying, I want you to go and tell them to repent, otherwise I'll destroy them. And Jonah thinks, go ahead and destroy them. It works for us. So he tries to do the opposite. He tries to think better than God. So we've got to be in a situation where we're trying to listen and trying carefully to be open to what God is doing. Ask him for a sign. So Gideon asked for a sign. Was it right or wrong? Just be careful about it. Okay, how you do it. Moses, in, in Exodus chapter 3, is stood in front of a burning bush. So this is, this is Moses in the wilderness. He's got no thoughts of God. He's turned his back on the Israelites who are in in slavery in Egypt and he's looking after his sheep he's minding his own business he's trying to get on life as best as he could but God wants to use him to be an agent for change to radically change the situation of his people to be the deliverer that gets God's people out of this slavery into freedom and into the promised land so God appears to him in this burning bush so there's a clear sign. There's a bush that's burning, that's not burning out, which Moses comes to. God speaks to him from it. And he says, God says to Moses, I want you to go back into Egypt and bring my people to this holy mountain to worship me. Now for Moses, that's quite clear because he can hear the voice. And so many of us say... Look, I'm asking you the question, God, and if you spoke to me with a clear voice like that, then I would know what you would do, and I'd just get on with it. If you appeared in a burning bush or a, a, as an angel or something like that, something miraculous, I'd know for definite what you want me to do, and I would trust you and get on with it gladly, with this assurance that you were telling me what to do. Has anyone seen a burning bush or an angel? Heard a clear voice from heaven? Yes, okay, some, some people do hear a clear voice from heaven. We need to learn to hear the voice of God. But Moses, even here in this, this situation, so Gideon sees the angel, doesn't believe it, and wants to do the opposite and stay where he is. Moses sees the burning bush, hears the voice of God, doesn't believe God, and is reluctant to do what God is telling him. I wonder if God is in heaven is saying that I've tried angels, I've tried burning bushes, people still don't believe me. What's the point? But God says to Moses, look, I can see you're hesitant. I'm going to give you a sign. Great. 
how wonderful to have a sign that this is all going to happen. Because how does Moses know, first of all, that the Israelites are going to listen to this 80-year-old stranger that turns up out of the wilderness and says, hey everyone, I'm here now, don't worry, we're going to go to the promised land. And they're going to go, who are you? So that's the first thing. And once he's got the Israelites on board, he's then got to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at that point, and say, listen Pharaoh, we've, I know you're enjoying having us all doing your slaving and all that stuff, but we're going to leave now. Is that alright? How's Pharaoh going to listen to him? So he's saying, okay God, you're telling me to do this. How do I know that I'll be successful? I wonder how many times we ask that question. We know that God is telling us to do something. How do we know that we'll be successful? You know, if God's telling you to do it, his plans always work out. And even if you try to do the opposite, like Jonah, his plans will still work out. And God says, look, Moses, here's a sign. I can imagine... Moses rummaging around in his shepherd's bag and getting out his pad and his pencil and thinking, I'm going to write this down. I've got a sign. How wonderful. And it says this in Exodus 3 and verse 12. And God said, I will be with you and this will be the sign that it is I who have sent you. This is a sign. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. In other words, the sign that God is sending you to do it is that you go and do it and you'll be successful. And I'd want something up front, wouldn't you? But the assurance is God says it will happen. They say that how do you how do you test a prophet? How do you know if a prophet is right? Well, watch to see if what they say comes true or not. How do you know if God is telling you to do something? We'll do it and see if it works or not. And by the way, sometimes God's idea of success is different to ours. We might think when God is saying to you, do you see that person that's ill, I want you to go and pray for them. And we think, oh, it's going to be a miracle. And we go and pray for them. And they stay ill. And we think, well, that was a waste. I, don't, I look stupid. God hasn't healed them. And, and what was that all about? But God's idea might not have been to heal them at that point. It might have been something else that he was doing through what he's told you to do. Here's some important questions. How are we doing for time? Let's go home. Here's some important questions for us to know. If Is it trust or stupidity? First of all, is wisdom killing my trust in God? If we're going to make a decision, let's do it wisely. Okay, let's look for, for wisdom. How do we seek wisdom? What would you do if you wanted wisdom? Ask God. Okay, so we pray and say, Lord, I need wisdom. I need you to help me to make the right decision. And that's good. He promises in James chapter 1, he says, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you. So ask him and believe you're going to get it. What else would you do? Fear God. Fear God, fear okay, God. fear God, fear God for wisdom, that's good. Nobody's Googled it yet? No? Okay. Read a book? Pat? You might talk to the people about it. Talk to other people, okay, that's good. Talk to people you can trust. Wise people. Wise people. Okay, if you can find them, talk to wise people. <laughs> Read God's word with open ears and an open mind. Sometimes we can get it fixed on our own hearts, what God wants us to do. And we can look through the word of God and listen to sermons and watch God TV and listen to worship songs and pick out the things that suit us and what we think we would really like to do for God rather than listening for what God is asking us to do. So read the word of God with open ears. There's another character in Adrian Plass's books that I read the diary from before, who's having a difficult time in Bible college and he gives it up and he comes home and he says to his, his family and his church, he says, I believe God wants me to go to Israel. And they say, why do you believe that? And he says, well, every time I open my Bible, it's all about Israel. 
And so, in other words, he's not actually listening to God. He's looking for a way out of the situation he's in. Which is why Ellen and I are in East Yorkshire and not, not in the Bahamas or anywhere else like that. So, pray expecting God to answer. The danger is playing it safe, though. That's what this says. Is my wisdom killing my trust in God? Am I playing it so safe that I'm not actually trusting in God? Because when God calls you to do something, He calls you very often to do things that look stupid, involve taking a risk. Give room for the divine. Give room for God to do spectacular things. God never does anything miraculous around here. Do we ask for miracles? Do we expect them? So let's not... Let's leave room for God to work. You know, in August 1993, some friends and I felt we were told by God to take aid out to Croatia during the civil war in the former Yugoslavia. We heard this call. It's quite a long story. I'll keep it short for you. But we heard this call on a Wednesday. On the Sunday, we stood up in church and we said, we believe that God is calling us to take aid out to Croatia. And we were working in a college, both of us working in a college, so we, we decided the best time to go would be the October half term. It gave us about three months to get stuff ready. People said, that sounds exciting. What are you taking? We said, we don't know. They said, how are you going to get there? We don't know. We, we've only just heard this ourselves. By the time we left, October half term, 1993, we got a seven and a half ton wagon, which was the biggest thing that we could drive on our license. We got enough stuff to fill it twice. We got a Land Rover, which we filled up, which we could take out and leave for the refugees who've got no transport. And God provided, miraculously, in amazing ways, all this came about. We stepped out in faith, God provided. So sometimes we need to be careful that wisdom, common sense, doesn't stop us trusting God to do amazing things. And the alternative to that is, is my trust in God disregarding all wisdom? Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. The, the, the Satan took him up to the highest point of the temple. And he says, look, just jump off. You're trusting in God. He'll send angels to protect you. He'll parachute you safely to the ground. Everyone will see how amazing you are. And they'll put their trust in you. A reckless risk. And, oh, a cheering stone. <laughs> and, um, and Jesus said to, said to Satan, don't tempt the Lord your God. Don't put him to the test. So does your hearing from God contradict his word? Be easy to say, to stay at home on Sunday morning, wouldn't it? Just uh, look at the clock and turn over and pull the covers over your head. So Je Jesus has told me not to meet with others. It's tempting. Now I've sowed that seed in your mind, I'll be watching to see who's missing next week. His word says, don't stop meeting together. However that is, wherever that is, whatever time that is, don't stop doing it. So when you cut yourself off from meeting other believers, what you're hearing from God is going against God's word. So we need to make sure that the decisions we make are in line with God's word. And here's the big test. Does this decision honour Jesus and build his kingdom? Or is it just all about me? Because if you're truly following Jesus Christ, if you've submitted to him as Lord of your life, then that's who he is. He's Lord. And it's what he wants, not what you want. Which is why, as I said before, we're not in the West Indies, we're in East Yorkshire. Okay, because it's, it's about doing what God tells you to do. And if it's all about, well, this is what suits me, like Jonah, going the wrong way, then it's not honouring God. I'd be very sceptical about followers being led to do things just for their own convenience. 
this came up on Facebook in the last week or so. It says this, if you think you've blown God's plan for your life, rest in this, you, my friend, are not that powerful. Like Jonah, not powerful enough to blow God's plan for his life as much as he tried. Because God is God. And our trust in him and his promises has to say that his will will be done. And sometimes along the way we will still make the wrong decision. But do you know what? Jesus is a redeemer. He can redeem our mistakes. He will bring the right things about. Remember the sign of Jonah. God will have his way in your life. Keep listening to him. Keep approaching him with an open mind. Keep seeking what he wants. Somebody once said, but what if God asked me to do something I don't want to do? Well, first of all, Who's the Lord and who's the servant? And secondly, he's a loving Lord. And he will give you the desire to do what he wants if you stay close to him. And so you'll end up doing what you really want to do anyway. So let's trust him on that. It's not an easy topic, I know. It's not easy to do. It's something that we learn as we walk with God, as we take each step and seek to honour and glorify Him. But just remember who's Lord and who's the servant. Don't be afraid to step out. Don't be afraid of looking stupid. If God, you really feel God is calling you to do something, and you've prayed about it, and you've listened and taken good advice, and you still feel it's the right thing to do, go out there. As stupid as it looks, and allow room for the divine, allow God to be glorified through his miraculous provision, his work in your life, the things that he accomplishes through you, his name's sake. Amen.